Hello, I'm Doug Casey. Since writing The International Man in 1976, I've had a lot to say about the process of internationalizing yourself. The book's subtitle was Making the Most of Your Personal Freedom and Financial Opportunity Around the World. But in recently going over our newsletters on the subject, I found that I, although I've had a lot to say about the financial aspects of internationalizing yourself, I haven't had so much to say about the physical aspects of doing so, and that's mostly what this video is going to be about. The book, The International Man, is long out of print, and copies are only available through book finders and Amazon used books, and copies go for several hundred dollars a piece. While I'm obviously biased, I've got to say The International Man is still a great read, but the world is obviously a different place from when I wrote the book, and I've learned quite a bit since 1976. That's why I'm very pleased to be involved in internationalman.com, which is a global community and an online intelligence network for international investors, speculators, freedom seekers, adventurers, and expatriates. Now, the book, The International Man, was directed towards Americans, but it found a fairly broad international market. In fact, it became the largest selling book in the history of Rhodesia. And I think that that fact alone provides a bit of an object lesson that we ought to pay attention to now. When I first went to Rhodesia in 1978, the war was still raging. And I thought that it would be wise to have the book published there. So I went out of my way and I found an entrepreneurial publisher named Gordon Graham who picked the book up. At that time, there were still about 250,000 people of European extraction among the six million population. And it was clear that most of them were eyeing the exits and wondering where to go. They could see the writing on the wall. Now, most of these whites were actually native Africans, born to families that had been in the country for generations, and they felt they had just as much right to be there as the blacks. But when it comes to such things, it's not a question of rights, but of political power. Today, there might be 5,000 whites that are still hanging on making what they called the chicken run 30 years ago was definitely the smart course but few of them had a bolt hole elsewhere to run to in any event my book flew off the shelves in rhodesia in those days as people desperately scrambled for the alternatives now the problem uh, your problem actually is that any country can turn into a 1970s rhodesia or a russia in the 1920s or a Germany in the 30s, a China in the 40s, a Cuba in the 50s, a Congo in the 60s, a Vietnam in the 70s, an Afghanistan in the 80s, a Bosnia in the 90s. And these are just examples off the top of my head. Now, only a fool tries to survive by acting like a vegetable, staying rooted to one place. When the economic and political climate changes for the worse, uh, you have to change too. And when the going gets tough, the tough get going elsewhere. Now that's what your forefathers once did, at least if you live in an immigrant-built country like the U.S. or Canada or Australia or New Zealand or Argentina. The point is, is that at different times, there are places that are good for doing certain things and places where it's bad to be. Who wouldn't have preferred to be in the U.S. rather than the USSR from 1920 to 1990? Ireland, for instance, was a dismal, depressing place for decades after World War II. Then in the 1990s, it blossomed. Africa was a very safe, prosperous, and enjoyable place before about 1960 when it started to degenerate into a gigantic hellhole. About every country on the planet has, has, it, has had its good times and its bad times. 
And that's one reason the original Baron de Rothschild sent his sons to several different countries. Some countries, like Russia, have been living at hard times central since day one. Others, like the U.S., have had good times for a long time. Now, a wise man, at least in my view, doesn't allow himself to be limited by an accident of birth. It's most unfortunate that most people have a peasant mentality. They're idiotically indoctrinated into thinking that their country is the best place in the world simply because that's where they were born. Now, this makes sense in a way. Their ancestors rarely ventured more than a day's walk from the village where they were born. After all, there were stories of dragons and demons over the hill. And in point of fact, things haven't changed much in hundreds of years, except that people have exchanged their mud huts for McMansions. But they've retained that medieval surf worldview, and the CNN and BBC broadcasts on their widescreens only reinforces the notion that things are dangerous outside their borders. They're probably even more scared than their primitive ancestors, assuming they watch anything besides sitcoms and sports. It's certainly possible to be living your entire life in the place where you were born and grew up, but it's almost always suboptimal and sometimes it can be disastrous, and I suspect now is one of those unhappy times. At Casey Research, we're of the opinion that the world at large, and the U.S. in particular, are heading into some seriously turbulent times. The diminution of personal and financial freedom looks like a hyperbolic curve. At first with an almost unnoticeable slope, and then one that gets steeper and steeper at an accelerating rate. I think that an excellent case can be made that the current crisis is at an inflection point beyond which it goes vertical. A crisis, and this is a very real one, will always draw exhortations from the authorities to unite and pull together, which usually boils down to following orders and turning in those who don't. People will want and they will get strong leadership. Uh, this does not bode well for libertarians, classical liberals, and free thinkers in general. As the crisis deepens, it's likely to be dangerous for someone who doesn't agree with the current groupthink. Now, things are likely to be much mellower if you're living somewhere where they consider you a tourist than to stay on your home turf where questions will be asked if you don't join the hooting and panting chimpanzees that are going to surround you. You can absolutely plan on unwelcome social pressure in the years to come, especially as the wars expand. Now, co coincidental with this is going to be the near destruction of the U.S. dollar. I don't see any realistic way around that eventuality at this point. The consequences of that are going to be disastrous, but it's possible to insulate yourself from many of them. The biggest problem, and also the one most people just don't see, however, is political, not economic. There's almost no way you can effectively insulate yourself if the government and society as a whole is going crazy. You might argue that really tough times in the U.S. are a long shot. The U.S. has been different from other countries for a long time. It's certainly true the U.S. has been particularly blessed for most of its existence because it actually was different. The problem is that what made the U.S. different in the past from every other country, namely a constitution that expressly limited the powers of the state and an explicit acceptance of property rights and the free market, has evanesced. That's why I refer to it as the U.S., which is just another country, rather than America, which was a unique and excellent concept. In any event, the time has come for you to at least consider the possibility of transplanting yourself, or at least start by transplanting some assets. Don't look at it as a negative thing. The world is your oyster. Make the most of it. This is directed not only at Americans, but at everybody everywhere. It just seems a little more urgent for Americans as well as for Europeans at this point. So, that being the case, let's talk about timing. It's a question of when. Now, in many ways, 
the world seemed to turn over a new leaf in the 1980s. Not just with the election of Reagan and Thatcher, but with the appearance of many more like them almost everywhere. Whether it's the hundredth monkey hypothesis, or whether there really is such a thing as a spirit of the century, the majority of people tend to hold similar views at the same time. It's strange. From about 1980 to 2000, all over the world, tax rates went down, regulation was relaxed, markets were freed up. The Soviet Union collapsed, apartheid in South Africa nonviolently disappeared, New Zealand fired two-thirds of its government employees, China liberalized. Even the constipated continents of Europe and South America loosened up. It looked like freedom was in the ascendant, but it couldn't last. Now, certainly since September 11th, 2001, the tenor of the world has changed again, and it's changed dramatically. And the negative new trend has been supercharged by the financial crisis that began to unfold in 2007. Now, practically everywhere, much higher taxes, onerous new regulations, border controls, capital controls. Uh, capital controls are meant to prevent the make-believe crime of money laundering and other things are the new order. It seems as if the clock has been turned back to the 1930s, but much worse in that governments are now much more powerful than they've ever been in the past. And I fear a redux of the 1940s is in store. The whole world acted pretty much the same in the 1930s and 40s as well, you'll recall. One thing I think you can plan on is foreign exchange controls. A government turns to foreign exchange controls during a currency crisis to prevent its citizens from swapping the local currency for something foreign, transactions that would further weaken the local currency. FX controls, in effect, force people to stay with a sinking ship, but they are politically popular for a number of reasons. They allow the government to do something during a crisis. They appeal to the average Yahoo partly because he doesn't travel abroad and he tends to question the patriotism of those who do. Only the rich, especially the unpatriotic ones, have assets out of the country and now it's time to eat the rich. We're heading into a currency crisis for the record books and I think you can plan your life around some type of FX controls. If you don't get significant assets out of your home country now, you may soon find it costly and very, very difficult to do so. Already, very few foreign banks and brokerage firms will take accounts from U.S. persons. But although there are reporting requirements, there's currently no law against Americans having overseas accounts and no laws against foreign banks and brokerage firms from accepting American business. But many institutions find that it's simply not worth the aggravation and the worry to deal with Americans. At a bare minimum, you should have a meaningful amount of gold in a foreign safe deposit box. In addition, you should own some foreign property, preferably in a location where you would enjoy spending some time. These things are currently not reportable and it would be impractical for the government to repatriate that capital. The ideal scenario, of course, is to have your main residence in one country, your assets in another, your business in a third, and your citizenship in a fourth. But that's not practical for most people. But you can certainly get your assets abroad as a first step. And you may want to consider acquiring a second citizenship, which can considerably expand your options. The International Man, the book, had a lot on this topic, but there's going to be a lot more for members of the International Man Network. It's not necessary and often not even desirable to establish official residence in the country where you'd like to spend time because that risks getting stuck in their tax system. It's usually smarter just to leave every 90 days to renew your tourist visa and not spend more than six months per year in any one country. That way you'll be treated as a valued tourist who should be courted rather than as a citizen who can be milked like a cow. Once you do acquire another passport, the next question is whether you should renounce your U.S. citizenship, which could give you huge tax and regulatory benefits. As everyone knows, 
The U.S. is one of the few countries in the world that tax their citizens regardless of where they may live, although it must be said that other governments seem to be moving in this direction. The problem with renouncing your U.S. citizenship is that the U.S. assesses what amounts to an exit tax on Americans who do so. Since 2004, any high net worth individual who renounces his citizenship is automatically assumed to have done so for tax reasons, and any individual deemed to have expatriated for tax reasons is deemed to have sold all of his assets at fair market value on his last day as a U.S. citizen. And if the expatriate spends more than 120 days per year in the U.S., he can be taxed on his worldwide income and potentially su subjected to a state tax. So in the near future, that, even that option may not be feasible. That being the case, let's plan ahead, which brings us to the question of where you might want to go. Now, I wrote The International Man as a guide for those who are looking for a place that could offer more of what they want. I can't cover all that ground in this short presentation. That's what the website and network are all about. But it is worth making a few observations about the world in general, and then about some areas and countries in particular. First, there may not actually be any one best place simply because you're dealing with the human animal who's subject to all manner of fears, hysteria, vices, and assorted aberrations. I don't know where Shangri-La is located. Therefore, you want some degree of diversification. You always have to have a plan B available. Second, there are roughly 225 distinct political entities around the world, and there are likely to be more as time goes on. There are advantages to places that are unstable, poor, repressed, and backward, just as there are disadvantages to places that are stable, free, rich, and advanced. A lot depends on who you are and what you want to do. Try to keep an open mind. Third, I don't think there's any doubt that the West, meaning North America, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, and Japan, is in relative decline. Meanwhile, places like China, India, and Vietnam are on their way up. The reasons are simple. In the developing world, a worker earns between one-fifth and one-thirtieth of what his counterpart does in the West. But he's just as smart, might even be better educated, and he's likely to work twice as hard and have less of an attitude of entitlement. It may be true, but less and less all the time, that developing countries have inferior infrastructure. Now, a number of them have telecoms, roads, airports, and such that are among the world's newest and best, while many of those that we have in the West are falling apart. At the same time, the general level of taxes and regulation tends to be much lower in developing countries. That's a big reason they're developing. Many of these countries have a better social ambiance as well, and that's reflected in the fact that their people are largely free of debt. They may not make much money, but they save something like 10 to 20 to 30 percent of what they do make. So instead of a mountain of debt that must be paid off, there's a growing pool of savings to be invested in these countries. The days of automatically having the odds tilted in your favor simply because you were born an American are coming to an end rapidly. By the end of this century, wages will be more or less normalized the world over. Americans also have had a huge advantage in speaking English, the world's most commonly spoken language. It's the language of science, business, aviation, entertainment, and other fields. But that advantage is also diminishing, as almost every educated person now has English as a second language. But most Americans have only English. Negatives to moving? Many of these places have large bureaucracies as a legacy from buying into various strains of socialism imported from Europe. There may not be much regulation of the type that we have in the West, but there are still plenty of forms that need to be processed and approved. In order to make things happen, bribes must sometimes be paid. I've discussed the ethical implications of paying bribes in the past, but suffice it to say that as developing countries become freer and wealthier, Bribery and general corruption will likely diminish. At the same time, as the U.S. becomes less free and wealthy, bribery and general corruption will greatly increase. I think it's incumbent upon any self-directed free man to go where he can uh, 
most fully realize himself. But where that is depends on who he is, and sometimes happenstance plays a part. I'm reminded of one of my favorite scenes in Casablanca where Claude Rains as Renault, the police inspector, asks Bogart, Rick, how'd a guy like you ever wind up in Casablanca? And Rick says, I came for the water. And Renault says, the water? But this is a desert, there's no water here. And Rick says, yeah, I was misinformed. So, with that in mind, let's do a brief tour of the world to limit misinformation. Although with the caveat that things are constantly changing, and that is another good reason for joining the International Man Network, where our correspondents are on the ground in all of these places, looking for both dangers and opportunities, and they regularly report on them. First, let's look at Europe. Now, from at least the 1600s, Europe could claim to be the center of world civilization on all fronts. The colonies of the Portuguese, Spanish, French, English, and Russian empires, with the Dutch, Germans, Italians, and Americans as bit players, covered almost the entire planet. In its early days, an empire is both fun and profitable. You get to loot and pillage at will, and an empire provides lots of room to relocate the disenchanted, the overly adventurous, and the criminals. But those days are long gone, and the way I see it, Western Europe is living off its accumulated capital. While it can take a while to burn through assets accumulated over hundreds of years, they're doing that quickly, as enamored as the continent has been with socialism. The other thing that's kept its head above water all these years is black money. The convenience of having lots of other countries nearby has helped make Europeans skilled and successful tax evaders. This has given them a lot more capital than they would have had otherwise had to use productively. But the rise of the European Union and the US-EU drive for tax harmonization and against money laundering and the lust to regulate coming out of Brussels is quashing most of the continent's remaining productivity. The place is on a very slippery economic slope. Will the European Union last, and will the euro, its currency, continue to exist? I would bet against it. A simple free trade pact, which means no restrictions on the movement of goods, capital, and labor in Europe, would have been a huge boon to everyone. But no, that would have been way too simple. They had to try to make it into a one-size-fits-all burnous that fits no one. Here's what's going to happen. The EU will fall apart with bad feelings all around, recriminations for subsidies and loans, and a rebirth of nationalism. The euro is going to cease to exist with more bad feelings and a lot of money lost by what's left of the middle class, mainly. And then it will be back to business as usual, which for Europe means war. And there are two additional complicating factors here, demography and Islam. Every country in Europe is in serious demographic decline. Now, this is to be expected as any society becomes more educated and more urban. It's aggravated, however, I think, by the continent's pervasive socialism. When the state acts as your parent, you tend to never grow up, leave home, and have a family. The state wants to take care of your kids, and your kids don't need to take care of you. So the decline of Europe's native population is likely to continue, if not accelerate. This relates to the question of Islam. It's well known that due to heavy immigration from their old colonies, North Africa in the case of France, Pakistan and India for Britain, Indonesia for Holland, and other reasons in the case of Germany and Switzerland, which is to say mainly Turkish immigration, the population of Europe has changed radically over the last 30 years. Furthermore, the trend is accelerating because the Muslims, for whatever reasons, tend to have large families. So it's said, in another 30 years, most of the countries in Europe will have Muslim majorities or significant pluralities. Frankly, I don't care where people come from, what color they are, or what superstitions they may hold, as long as they don't try to impose them on me. But it seems predictable that this demographic revolution, especially coming at a time of rising nationalism, is going to lead to some serious conflict.
Could Europe turn into a large-scale Bosnia? I'm not predicting it will, but that's not out of the question. The bottom line, Europe is fine for vacations, even though it's way too conservative and way too expensive to suit my taste. But for an expat looking for a permanent base, you're asking for trouble if you're looking at Europe. So, that probably leads us to the Islamic world. Let's take a look at that. We've been talking about Muslims in Europe. Does it make any sense to reverse the flow in effect? I have to say, regrettably, not. One reason is that Muslims tend to take their religion much more seriously than Christians, Buddhists, Hindus, or any other group I can think of. Islam is much more than a religion. It's an all-encompassing worldview with serious economic, political, and social implications. It's one thing being a tourist or a visiting businessman in one of the 40-something Islamic countries, but it's something else entirely to focus your life there. All these countries were ex-European colonies, all of them, which has left lingering resentment in some quarters. And practically all of these countries were created. Iraq, Jordan, Pakistan, Libya, Somalia, Afghanistan, forget about it, Stan, by fiat in a European boardroom with zero regard to existing ethnic, linguistic, cultural distinctions. That means they're all intrinsically unstable. And most of these countries will fall apart sooner rather than later. The situation's aggravated by the ongoing and growing war with Islam, called by the more politically correct but ridiculous and dishonest moniker, the War on Terror. This is really just a continuation of what's been going on sporadically since the Crusades. I think it's going to get much more serious before it goes into remission again. If you want to see the pyramids, rent a villa in Marrakesh, or speculate on property in Dubai or Cairo, as a friend of mine is currently doing, that's one thing. As a focus for your life, I think it's a mistake. So let's talk about Africa. The whole continent is a nearly unmitigated disaster and a tragedy. There are some who say that Africa should have been forever grateful to Europe if da Gama had just thrown a wheel ashore as he was rounding the Cape, but he would also have had to have thrown out an instruction book because nobody on the continent knew how to read at the time. Well, my own view is that European colonization was the worst thing that could have happened to Africa. It's true that the Africans were living in primitive conditions, but that would have changed organically through trade if Europeans had arrived as merchants instead of conquerors. What happened is that every country on the continent, with the exception of Egypt and Ethiopia, is a totally artificial construct, a figment of some European bureaucrat's imagination. Every government on the continent is therefore a kleptocracy. If you're an ambitious African who wants to make money, your first stop is to try to take control of the state and then cement your position by filling every important position with your friends and tribal relations. The state can then serve as your personal piggy bank. Pre-conquest Africa was no model of libertarian equity, it's true, but the thousands of tribes at least had societies and economies that worked over many generations. Military conquest allowed the overnight infusion of advanced technologies and a political structure that submerged the natives and their cultures. Worse, though, the ones that got a Western education were indoctrinated with the totally alien philosophy of Marxism and the alien religion of Christianity. This guaranteed long-term conflict with the equally alien religion of Islam. The poor African, who previously lived in about the most traditional of all societies, was uprooted and set adrift in every way possible. As far as I'm concerned, Africa is going nowhere until the present states that cover the continent like a skin disease are uprooted and restructured. So let's go to the, one of the bright spots on the planet, which is the Orient. This is where the future lies. I'm a longtime fan of the Orient, including as a place to live. It's true, the whole area was colonized by the Europeans, with the prominent exceptions of Thailand and Japan, but the culture of the region is so old and deep and the population so large that it's retained its basic character. But how is it for expatriation? 
My second most favorite country on the planet is Thailand, for many reasons I won't even attempt to touch on here. Singapore has replaced Hong Kong, a place that I lived for a number of years, as the hub for entrepreneurs and rich expats in the region. The Philippines, the perennial poor man who should have become rich, is worth a serious look. The 400 years of Spanish influence with an American overlay gives it a nice ambiance from my point of view. Burma, however, is the country I'd most likely spend serious time in if I really wanted to make a huge amount of money, uh, given a long-term view. The key thing to remember in the Orient is that although it's a fantastic place to live, if you're not a native, you're never going to become part of the local culture. This is a double-edged sword, though. It can be a huge advantage to be viewed only as a tourist, a foreign ghost. It can allow significant extra freedoms and leeway. The big question in the Orient is China. My view is that although the 21st will be China's century, they're in for some very serious problems along the way. The business cycle runs there, too. And it's been immensely aggravated by the huge influx of U.S. dollars and the building of a manufacturing infra infrastructure catering to overextended Americans. I'd be really surprised if this property market doesn't collapse. So, talking about Americans, let's take a look at North America. Canada presents an excellent and nearby opportunity for Americans. It's America light. It has less in the way of financial problems than the U.S. And with numerous new taxes on the way in the U.S., Canada will soon be the lower tax jurisdiction as well. But since Canadians, like almost everybody in the world except Americans, aren't subject to tax if they don't live in Canada, it's a mystery to me why anyone with capital doesn't expatriate. The answer, of course, is that surf mentality, keeping you close to what you know. Canadians suffer from it to a greater degree than Americans. It's a generally more socially conservative country. It's a good time to leave Canada, though, since its property is quite overpriced by almost any standard, especially in Vancouver. That said, I'm very fond of Canada, as are Asians. They are, for instance, now more than 50% of the population of British Columbia. The U.S., even though it's perhaps the major epicenter of the Greater Depression, which we're now embarked upon, still may be the best place for an immigrant to come to make his fortune. This will change, however, as the general standard of living in the U.S. drops. As recently as a generation ago, the U.S. would have gotten the nod as the best country for someone to make the most of his personal freedom and financial opportunity, but now that's definitely no longer the case. So, let's go to Oceania and take a look at that. You've got to like Australia and New Zealand. Consider them like Canada, but with good weather. My choice is New Zealand of the two, perhaps the most benign place on the globe where nothing will hurt, hurt you except for perhaps a visiting Australian stock promoter. The problem is that it's a quiet and insular place with as many cattle and 20 times as many sheep as people. But it has some good universities. And I'm in Auckland a couple months of the year for reasons of convenience and polo. When people ask me what I'm doing in New Zealand, I usually answer, I came for the kangaroos. Australia is surprisingly, perhaps, the most urbanized country in the world, crocodile Dundee myths notwithstanding. Maybe that's because in the outback, everything will kill you from the heat to the snakes. Sydney and Melbourne are great cities. This country is uniquely blessed in a lot of ways. Nothing wrong with it, but the government, which seems consistently dominated by people with a peculiarly British lower middle class view of the world. Property is now in a debt-driven bubble that will be ugly when it bursts, and it's going to burst soon. The country is always imitated, but has been a bit behind the U.S. So, let's take a look at Latin America, which in many ways is my current favorite, all things considered. First, let's forget the Caribbean countries. They're too insular, obviously, they're islands unsophisticated, they're viciously expensive, and they're racially charged. Mexico is heading for trouble in that almost half the government's revenue comes from the Cantarell oil field alone, which is well into terminal decline. That means that 
Not only will the government be madly scrambling for cash, but the place will shortly go from being a major oil exporter, mainly to the U.S., to a major importer. The drug wars along the border were long overdue and aren't going away unless drugs are legalized in the U.S. But that's not likely to happen for any number of reasons, not least of which is the entrenched bureaucracy in the DEA, which will never permit it. In Central America, Nicaragua is cheap, and that recommends it. Costa Rica, however, is overbuilt, it's discovered, and expensive. Guatemala is sophisticated, but I suspect the Longoria War, which in some ways was a war between the rich European immigrants and the poor Indian natives, could be a simmering problem. Forget about overpopulated El Salvador. The most interesting country in Central America, I think, is Panama. Even though it's hot, humid, and corrupt, I still think you should put it on your list, as well as Belize, which is demographically actually more part of the Caribbean than Central America. The problem with Central America is that it just lacks class. A lot of the people that go there are down on their luck. I call them Central American Americans. They're mostly there for the available young girls, the cheap beer, and the warm weather. Forget about Venezuela. But it's not just Chavez. It's that oil has completely corrupted the society in the past and for a long time to come. Colombia, however, is getting much better, especially around Cartagena, which is almost a separate country within the country of Colombia. Ecuador, like Bolivia and Peru, suffers from a divide between the Indians and the immigrants. But the eastern part of Bolivia could be nice if the country breaks in two, which is not unlikely and is a potential opportunity in the making. Chile is the Latin American country where everything works. The average Chilean now has a higher net worth than the average American. And Santiago is one of the safest large cities in the world with the caveat that pretty much the whole country sits on a large and active seismic fault. Uruguay is basically a quiet, sleepy, backward province of Argentina, but it's got a lot of advantages, and I think Uruguay has got a great future. Which brings us to Argentina, my personal favorite. It's a rich country down on its luck because of decades of destructive government mismanagement. But I like it because of Buenos Aires class and style, it's low population, it's wide open spaces, it's low costs. At this point, it's more European than Europe, but without most of that continent's risks and aggravations. And if the government simply stops being actively stupid, the place should regain its previous place as one of the world's richest countries. It presents a great speculative opportunity, which is one of the reasons I like it, but there are others. If it doesn't reform, it's still gonna be a fantastic place to be from a lifestyle point of view. In the meantime, it's pretty much out of harm's way relative to most of the serious problems that confront the world today. So that's where I'm placing a few bets personally, since you can't be everywhere at the same time. In conclusion, I think that time is growing short as the economy emerges from the eye of the current hurricane, after which it's going to encounter several bigger storms and there you have it. Don't look at this as idle information. It's time for you to do something. I suggest you sign up as a member of the internationalman.com and allocate some time to learning more about the various financial and lifestyle strategies of internationally diversifying your affairs. Then, you're ready to call your travel agent and get going.